Hi everyone, I'm Heaven. I'm Tracy. And welcome to another round with Heaven and Tracy. We are both writers at BuzzFeed.com, the website, and we focus mainly on issues of race and gender and pop culture. All right, y'all. So because it's our first podcast, we want to talk a little bit about things you'll probably see from us, just random topics we're probably going to cover. It's just bound to happen. Things that you can expect to hear us talk about include race. Race. It's going to happen. Also gender. Also Obama. (laughs) Yes. For obvious reasons. Yes. Mm. It's just going to come up. Mm. Liquor. We enjoy. This is called Another Round, so we're going to be drinking until noted otherwise. Black comics from the 90s. What are they doing now? Where's Bruce Bruce? Where's Shane Forbes? Okay. I don't know. It's okay. (laughs) Nobody knows. (laughs) We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Um, we're also going to have a lot of really great guests on. Not every episode, but pretty frequently. Also, we, we can talk about um, all of the things that Heaven recently found out are real things. Heaven's discovery. Uh, which is a lot of things. I don't know a lot. Including <laughs> boomerangs. In my defense, I've been in this country 18 years and I still know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Even though boomerangs are in Australia. <laughs> We didn't have uh, boomerangs in Kentucky either. I mean, I still know what a boomerang okay. is, but I mean, I'm <laughs> I, saying. You set that up to. <laughs> okay. Mary J. Blige and how she's been doing the same dance for 21 years. And we got to talk about, which Mary J. Blige did do, all the urban commercials for fast food places. Oh, uh, like the, the urban, the, the McDonald's. KFC commercial she did. <laughs> of the crispy uh, chicken oh. for salad. Na, na, na. It's a low-key catchy jam, though. It was. You know what else was catchy? What? That uh, late night quiet storm R&B uh, chicken nuggets remix. From McDonald's? From McDonald's. <laughs> yes. Girl, you got a 10 piece. Please don't be stingy. <laughs> On today's podcast, we're going to talk with writer Durga Chubos. The brilliant. The esteemed. The prolific. And Heaven's going to be reading one of her classic BuzzFeed lists. And then Tracy's going to tell a corny ass joke to me. Oh my gosh. After we talk about everything that's wrong with society, we are going (laughs) to liven this shit up with one of the worst jokes that you've ever heard that I love so much. I've been telling this joke for 15 years, and I think that we're going to do this every episode, or at least every other episode. Tracy's petitioning to make this a regular thing. I want it to be a thing. It just makes me so happy. Jokes. Tracy's corny jokes. That's a great yes. That's our theme we song. We have a theme song, so now we have to do it every episode. Tracy's corny jokes. <laughs> but first, we're going to have a little storytelling segment, which we're calling What Had Happened Was. What Had Happened Was is a segment where we just tell a random story about something crazy that happened to us. And literally every great story starts with what had happened was. Every great story and every... And horrible all, story. Yes, every, <laughs> yeah. every horrible Every story. Every disaster and every uh, triumph. What happened was, so I have some amazing friends, Cynthia and Aaron. Hey, girls. Hey, how y'all doing? So I hadn't seen them in a very long time. And mm-hmm. so Cynthia's like, well, I've got all these things lined up for the week. There's this party on Saturday. I would love it if you guys could come with me. So she sent those party details. The party actually sounds really, really dope. Here's the details of the party, right? First of all... It's a birthday party for this guy named Seymour, right? Okay. First of all, <laughs> I would like <laughs> our audience to know that name was changed. Yes, his name and is not actually I Seymour, but it's... I desperately would love to share the name with you, but uh, we cannot disclose that yeah. at this time. Because... Because the guys are really It's an nice incredible guy, name. And you know. It approximates you more, but not quite. Names have been changed to protect the innocent and also <laughs> the guilty. Okay. So. All right. Seymour's Seymour. party. Seymour is a friend of my good friend, Cynthia. And um, so the name of the party is Seymour's International Soiree. Okay. <laughs> Oh, already shit. Already. It's already a we're at a thousand. Firstly, it's international. Secondly, not domestic. Not domestic. Get <laughs> that shit out that. of here. <laughs> we don't do none of that. Thirdly, it's in Brooklyn, right? Okay. Fourthly, Seymour is described as an artist. Okay. All his friends are artists, so this is gonna be like a super swanky artist party in Brooklyn. <laughs> artist party in Brooklyn. <laughs> Also, the singing group Les Nubians are performing. Okay. So we get like a show. We get like like party, fun time, turn up stuff happening. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in. The food was promised. It was going to be hors d'oeuvres, drinks, and food. Okay. Right? This, Which made this me less. sounds great, <laughs> and you keep saying it. So far. <laughs> so far. Hang in there with me. So this justified me paying $15, uh, or actually $20, to get into this house party. $20? So the stipulation is that it's $20 a head. Presumably to pay for all the food and stuff that we were going to be eating. Sure, sure. But if you brought your own bottle of champagne or wine, then it was $15. So I heard this and I'm like, okay, carry the two 
multiply by <laughs> this doesn't make a whole lot of sense you know because if i'm gonna bring a good bottle of something it's right. gonna be more than five dollars so did you bring something i did not <laughs> <laughs> yeah they set I that went. up to not I know, happen <laughs> i know so i'm like all right you know what fine i haven't seen my girls in a while this is gonna be a great artsy fartsy black brooklyn party nice i'm in had to dress to impress. I have no dressy clothes because I'm in the middle of moving, kind of, sort of, which is another story. So I'm out all day busting my ass trying to find something cute to wear. I Aww. fail. I end up in this dress that I hate and these shoes that I hate. <laughs> oh. So I was so disappointed at not being able to find a nice outfit because I'm trying to go to this place and get chose, right? <laughs> like, I want to sure. find, like, a nice... I don't want a poet. I've already gone the poet route. I don't oh, want no. another one of those. But, like, a nice acoustic guitarist, maybe. <laughs> You know, what is the black version of like, anyway, here's Wonderwall. <laughs> <laughs> you thought no, that would happen at the party. That's and then you what I like, wanted. Me. I want that. <laughs> that's me. I'll take this one. Check, please. So we get there and it's somebody's apartment, which fine. I, for some reason, wasn't expecting an apartment. Like I was thinking it was, it was a house like party. This. I know. I didn't know it was a house party until I got. Oh, well, that's I mean, my the bad. soiree kind of throws it soiree. off. It's a soiree. This should have been like a garden ballroom. <laughs> sure. A ballroom with a garden inside of it. Yes. Something like a waterfall. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> right. But it's just kind of like this. I mean, like the apartment was big, like it had several rooms, but like the hallways are really narrow and they had it decorated in like this. Um, if you went to like your Aunt Gertrude's <laughs> nope. 68th birthday party, you know, like there were like. Christmas lights and like all of the light bulbs have been replaced with red light bulbs to like give it some kind of like mood okay, a lighting. Little, a little edgy. You know what? I'm still into it. Okay. okay sure, listen, I'm sure. in Brooklyn. I'm getting ready to meet my guitarist. <laughs> my life is going to change tonight. Okay. So I'm good. I'm ready. I'm also starving because I spent the evening trying to find something cute to wear. And I'm in a bad mood because I didn't have anything cute to wear. When I'm mad, <laughs> I eat. I also eat when I'm happy. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. So we get there and we see this man who's dressed head to toe in purple. Okay. He like a, is... Like a zoot suit? Steve Harvey suit, maybe? He's oh, also no. wearing like this really big black overcoat, so we can't see everything. But this man had on a purple hat. He had on a purple scarf. This man had purple leather gloves. <laughs> Do you hear what I just told you? You didn't. I'm going to say it one more wait, time. Where? He had purple leather I, gloves. Where would you even buy that? I did not okay. ask this man any questions. Sure. But we're getting out of the car and we see this man in front of us getting out of the car. And I jokingly said, hey, guys, what if he's going to the same party? That would be really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so we all end up in the same oh, elevator. No. I'm like, oh, shit, we're he's all going, going to the, to the same, same party. <laughs> but you know what? I'm still into it, though. I'm okay. just like, this is, this is Seymour's uncle. This is Seymour's sure. dad. Whatever. Something. I'm still okay. His sponsor, maybe. <laughs> right. So we get in and everything is red and narrow. And there's a DJ set up in one room. There's also supposed to be a, an open mic because it's a bunch of poets and guitarists. Hello, of course, <laughs> it's going to be an open mic. And so we get in and we get to the bar. The bar has no liquor on it at all. It's just like as people are bringing bottles in, that's how the bar oh, was no. stocked. Uh -uh. So it's like the best $5 bottles of shampoo <laughs> that you can find <laughs> uh, at your local like whatever store. So but, not a bar. You know, I've I've had some pretty shitty liquor, so I'm still kind of into it, but I'm also like... <sighs> And so then we meet Seymour. Mm. Seymour is an, an adorable man. He apparently is a very accomplished artist. Mm -hmm. He's also like a smooth 65. <laughs> <laughs> this is the birthday boy. Why does your friend know these people? Cynthia is a, is a very, she's a woman of the world. Her and her friends met him in like a, a party or something New Year's Eve. They had a great time. I believe it. I'm sure they do. <laughs> okay. So anyway, this is not the worst part of the story because I will party with some old people. Here's my thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we were the youngest people there. I'm 32, mm -hmm. which, and I think I may have been like the oldest in our group, maybe mm -hmm. like mid 30s and younger. Okay. Everybody else there was Seymour's age or older. All the men were cat daddies. Are you familiar with the phrase <laughs> cat daddy? I am because you impersonate them so. Much. <laughs> Can you do your cat daddy laugh? <laughs> So a cat daddy, for those listening who are not familiar, a cat daddy is a 65-year-old plus man who dresses in nothing but Steve Harvey suits, mm -hmm. Stacey Adams shoes of very loud colors, linen very shirts, loud. very yeah. loud. And they go to these, like, clubs on the weekends, and they just like to go and, like, buy young girls drinks. Yeah. Which is why I love a cat daddy. I'm I broke. Mean, sure. It's not payday. <laughs> yes. Listen, let's will, go to Frank's yes. in Brooklyn and see what we can do, you okay. know? So they walk up to you and they're just like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> uh, I'm like, I'm I'm fine. 
oh, well, I can see you fine, but I asked you how you doing. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. So this is a cat daddy, okay? Oh, man. Every man there who was not a DJ, there were only two DJs. So basically every man there is a cat daddy. Now, in a club situation, you I, there's something that we can trade, right? You can buy me a drink. I'll give you a few minutes of conversation. Then I take my black ass home here. <laughs> the drinks are already free. So I don't want to talk to you guys. However, so we're sitting on a bench, me and all five of my friends. And like, there's a literal arc of cat daddies. Just like, oh. they like built a, a wall. That like sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> like a flying V of poorly dressed geese. <laughs> <laughs> Is what this was. And like they were just like openly staring and like pointing and like talking amongst themselves. Right. Mind you, I'm starving. I'm not in a good mood. (laughs) I have to be in a good mood to deal with these dudes. Don't try Casey when she's hungry. You can't. Don't try it. You would not like me when I'm hungry. I become (laughs) someone else. So I'm just like, okay, let me suffer these fools and just wait for dinner. Mm. 12 o'clock comes. 12.30 comes. We get very, very close to 1 o'clock. Mind you. In this time span, we also, not accosted, accosted is not the exact right word, Mm -hmm. but the women there were were old Mm -hmm. also. They were like um, the head deacon's wife in like a a church. (laughs) Even as I said it, it sounded horrible. (laughs) This is a great question. Cat mommies? They would not be called cat mommies. I just call them all Aunt Cheryl. Because oh, they just true. all look yeah, like all their names aunties. are Shirley. Yeah. Just like, you know, the auntie is like, well, all the kids are going yeah. out the house. Now it's time to do me. <laughs> Put on my cat suit. Go to Frank's in Brooklyn. And I'm going to party down. Whatever old people say. I don't know. But the women, like, were very mistrustful of us because we were sitting down and we were not up and dancing, right? Mm-hmm. So there were two women in particular who really stick out to me. The first woman walked in. She was probably about, and I'm, I think that 65 is a good median age for everybody. Mm-hmm. So she walks in and like, I know that the invitation said dress to impress, but this <laughs> sister was just like, she had on four different items of clothing that were all sequins. <laughs> this woman had on a sequin beret. Oh man. A silver sequin tube top. <laughs> Ooh. A tube top. Yes. Over that was a black sequin cardigan. Okay. And she had on like some sequin like pants where do you even i don't even know i'm not even mad at that but i was like you know what okay i freaked out over not having anything to wear for nothing i understand (laughs) this now i realize it whatever i'll accept this this fail this is my fault and then this other woman comes in so purple was the color of the night because she walked in with a a floor-length purple dashiki oh no And I, also a matching. Where do you even buy a floor length dashiki? Where do you get a ball gown dashiki? That's incredible. To it's be wild, honest. right? And she also has on a matching purple turban. Nice. So you see somebody dressed that way, and you're like, oh, you know, she's she's real bougie hotep. You know, she's into the open the open <laughs> mic scene. She does poetry. She's real natural. She uses shea butter. <laughs> you know, she's not she's not ratchet at all. And she also, for some reason, has her own tambourine. This woman brought her own tambourine to the party. To the party. Okay. Okay. So she walks in and she's at the bar. She turns around and sees us and like her face just like contorts into this like crazy, scornful, like uh, Picasso, right? The auntie face. The, <laughs> the displeased auntie yes. face. And Cheryl's not having us yes. at all. So she turns around. She's like, mm, why y'all ain't dancing? Y'all supposed to be up shaking butts and tambourines. Her exact words. <laughs> I say, oh, I'm sorry. We left our tambourines at home. Send my other person. I'm sorry. This woman's like, fine, hands me her tambourine. What are you going to do with the tambourine, though? You know what? I'm a team player. <laughs> I'm, I'm not there to start a scene at Seymour's birthday. So I take the tambourine. I start playing it to the song that's playing, which is I'll Be by Foxy Brown and Jay-Z. Right? So I'm just shaking it. And I'm like kidding it on my wrist like I see the people at church do all the time. I don't know how to play a tambourine. I guess this is what you do. And so I'm kind of just like playing it, kind of bouncing or whatever. Like, haha, you didn't get the best of me. You didn't think I was going to play the tambourine, did you? But look. Challenge shake, accepted. Shake, shake. She gets mad. Oh, my God. I say, I'm hoping that it was in a playful spirit, but she had a few to drink. But she said something like, oh, you getting sexy with it. Give me my goddamn tambourine. Sexy with the tambourine. With the tambourine. Who would you How? How do you seduce the one with the tambourine? I've never once seen a sexy sexy tambourine performance. Apparently, my sex appeal knows no bounds. <laughs> yes, Tracy. And it made her very uncomfortable. So she yes. snatches the tambourine from me. She walks out. At varying points of the night, I hear her just like going to town with the tambourine. <laughs> yeah, in the back somewhere. Like cameos playing. Like, word up. Shake, 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 shake. <laughs> it was crazy. Anyway, so at this point, it's probably about 1245. Still no food. I'm like, listen, y'all got to either feed me or I'm like tipping over a table or something. I go to ask where the food is and Seymour's like, oh, well, we're trying to wait for the performance to happen. I'm like, it's your party. Just be like, it's time for y'all yeah. to sing. And apparently only one of, of Lay Nubians was there. 
I just cannot. Un Nubian. <laughs> un Nubian. <laughs> exactly. Just un. Just un. And so, long story even longer, it was like... 1.30 maybe until we ate. The food was horrible. It was like this soupy mixture of like mixed vegetables and uh. rice and fish that was riddled with bones. I don't even <laughs> like fish. So we left and I was just like, well, this, this is, is just a, all the weird. sad turns. I know. So here are the morals of the story. <laughs> if a man named Seymour invites you out anywhere, I encourage you to go, but maybe don't spend a lot of money to do that. Mm hmm. Number two, if someone charges you twenty, fifteen to twenty dollars for a house party, no, you know, respect the sanctity of the house party. I think that's the moral of the story. Also, just like a general life lesson that I've learned and adopted is just set your bar low, <laughs> no matter what you're doing and where you're going. Because and it now really decreases you the like chances <laughs> that you'll be disappointed. You know, so that's what it happened. That's what had happened. Okay, so next, I'm very, very thrilled and excited to have Heaven read one of the favorite pieces of mine that she's written to date. Hey. Okay, so the piece is called If White Characters Were Described Like People of Color in Literature. And to be clear, brown people are always described in some form of edible food term, right? Like mocha, chocolata, yaya, apple, cinnamon, cafe au lait, creamed milk, tea. <laughs> Like, it's really ridiculous. <laughs> so what inspired you to write this piece? I've been meaning to write about this for a while. Just like the general trend, if you read anything in literature, or even if you're like on dating apps, <laughs> where people will describe you in those terms. But I felt the need to like educate people. So I didn't write it for a really long time because it was like, I didn't really want to write like a thousand listed example of all the times people mm -hmm. of color in literature were described this way. I was like, okay, that's boring. I want to have a little fun with it. I was like, all right, y'all, listen for a second. <laughs> Imagine if this was you, you'd feel some type of way too. <laughs> you'd be a little salty. So I just had a little fun with it. I was like, all right, white people. I'm so excited. Let's it's read some literature fun. through my point of view. <laughs> let's do that for a second. Awesome. One, he looked at her longingly as he imagined her exotic mashed potato skin laying gently against <laughs> his. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds kind of tasty. I like mashed potatoes. Oh, man. I really had a lot of fun writing this. <laughs> Two, she took off his shirt, his skin glistening in the sun like a glazed donut. The glaze part, not the donut part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Honestly, this really makes me want to cackle. <laughs> Three. His eyes look like eyes because they were eye-shaped, not almonds. What is it with people describing eyes as almond-shaped? I honestly don't know what, Why don't what they that say even football means. Shape? This is the same <laughs> shape. <laughs> football head shaped. <laughs> <laughs> Four. Mr. Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, and his crust of a shepherd's pie complexion. <laughs> that is actually a sentence from... Pride and Prejudice that I just <laughs> interchanged with shepherd's pie. <laughs> Five. What's your name, he asked. Mary, she replied, as the strap of her dress slipped off her marzipan shoulder. Six. She didn't know it yet, but the girl of her dreams had just walked in. Her eyes were radiant and her skin glowed with mozzarella undertones. <laughs> Seven. She was beautiful, elegant, like a tall, clear glass filled with raw pasta. This is my favorite one. <laughs> Eight. His body had the color and shape of raw ground beef. Ugh. Nine. He traced his fingers along her supple cauliflower skin. <laughs> Ten. She stepped out of the car and was delighted by the cool summer breeze that brushed against her legs. She had been sitting in the sun earlier and welcomed the relief of the fresh air on her mayonnaise legs. Ew. Classic mayo jug, white people. <laughs> you get it? You hey. get it? <laughs> Eleven. She had brown, wiry hair and skin that can only be described as the color of the inside of an apple. The mushy ones, not the cool, crisp ones. They couldn't even get the cool, crisp ones. <laughs> That's the worst. Reverse racism at its finest. Look at this. Twelve. She dove into the ocean, the blue waves enveloping her tapioca skin. Right, the texture of all this stuff is just, like, really gross. <laughs> You're <Yeah>. welcome. <laughs> Thirteen. She was transfixed by the gleam of his uncooked chicken breast skin. So raw. So lumpy. <laughs> 14. 
His bones were as brittle as a vanilla wafer. 15. Her beauty was indescribable, which means she's white. Mm. Mm-hmm. Message. A little message in there. <laughs> 16. For the first time in his life, he found himself imagining a future together with someone. He was embarrassed to tell her this, but he had never really been in love with the woman he had dated. Well, who would play me in this rom-com of your life, she teasingly inquired. You have such beautiful olive skin, he crooned. So you can be a person of color or racially ambiguous in the book, but definitely a white woman in the movie. And that, my friends, is called a read. <laughs> that is direct Hello. shots at the Hunger Games, if that was unclear. <laughs> shots fired over here. <laughs> that is so great. Imagine if so, like so one great. of the biggest YA turned like blockbuster franchises was, was about a woman of color, mm. which in the book was pretty ambiguously described. Right. Just let brown people have things. That's all I'm saying. That's it. That's how we want. That's all I'm saying. That's it. Get Obama on the phone. This week's guest, I have my friend and person I look up to, <laughs> the writer Durga Chuvos. She wrote an incredible essay for BuzzFeed Ideas about names and identities and how we present ourselves to the world and how the world takes us in. It's called How I Learned to Stop Erasing Myself, and she's going to read a little bit for us. Thanks, Evan. Durgan, Jurga, Durva, Derica, Durgid. These are just some of the names people have misheard when I introduce myself. I rarely correct them, having long been convinced it's easier this way. Easier in the totally yielding sense of the word, as if being impartial about and casually erasing my most essential self, my name, complies with an imaginary code I've lived by, that establishing room for everyone else is the quickest route to assimilation. My mispronounced name was, I'd fooled myself into believing, how things would always be. Like that one button on my winter coat that I'm constantly sewing back on, or how I'll never be someone who knows any jokes. And so at 28, I'm still skittish with my own name, fumbling during first meetings as if Durga were a bar of wet soap. I think what struck me the most about this essay was I didn't realize how much this was weighing on me. Like, I have a complicated name for a lot of reasons. One of them is the American immigration system that spelled my name wrong. Uh, that's a different story. Class X. <laughs> Class X. But a lot of immigrants I know have, like, typo immigration stories. But I, I didn't realize, like, the cumulative effect yeah. of how I'm constantly interacting with my name. But I do think there's something to be said about, like, from, a, from like, the get-go, from introductions, knowing that you are not going to be easy to swallow makes you tougher. And speaking to your name, Tracy, I think what was interesting about that, about writing that piece was that, you know, there were a lot of comments from people saying, well, actually, my name is, like, Anna, but... Hmm. My skin is really dark, and that confuses hmm. people. So, True. Also, pronouncing someone's name right and valuing that as the thing you should get right from the beginning, mm -hmm. I think not every American has that value. Right. And it's like the nerve of them to make like jokes about uh, like our names, mm -hmm. and they're naming their children like Willard Romney. <laughs> <laughs> or the, <laughs> the Republican chair was Reince Priebus. What is that? What is a Reince Priebus? Uh, I also want to talk about something you tweeted recently. A year endless, but of everything you've unlearned. And I think both of those are related, like the name thing about learning and unlearning, how people perceive you, how people take you in just initially. And I kind of wanted to talk about that. What are the things you've unlearned this year? That's a good question, because I think it's like an ongoing process that has... Um, started over the last couple of years. And so I don't know if I have like a tally so much as it's just happening and I it comes out of nowhere. And then I'm like, oh, this is something that was pushed on me for so long. And now I'm learning to put a pause button and restart. So I think it actually started when I realized that, and I wrote about this in the essay, that I'll have ideas a lot of the time. Mm. And I've never felt confident enough to express them or put them in an essay. Mm -hmm. And I started to wonder why, because I love reading and I love women writers and I love first person essays, yet it never seemed like an obvious choice for me. And so I started talking to more women about that, especially brown women. And I realized it was something we all shared, whereas a lot of people will hear us talking and say, that's a brilliant idea. You should write about that. Mm. And it was always sort of a surprise to me, like, really? 
And then I realized I don't really need to wait for someone to tell me that that's a good idea. I should just start writing it and get a lot of like nods from the people that I should be writing for. So that would probably be the first one as a writer to relearn how to write or unlearn how to write and then relearn. And I think the first way to do that is simply write with specific people in mind. So what what did that like free you up to write? What are you like now all up in it now? Well, okay. And then with the flip side of that is yeah. like, this is something I've been thinking about. The problem with then like readjusting is you don't want to be a beat writer for race right. <laughs> or a beat writer for Ooh. brown women. Yes, that's exhausting. It's exhausting. And I have to say the most exhausting thing for brown women who write and what will ultimately burn us all out is mm -hmm. that we're actually expected to explain things to white audiences. Yes, to everyone, that's the default mode for everybody. writing about exactly any brown. And anything. it's like I'm down for that if you PayPal me money. <laughs> like if Get this, your paper. If this is going to be like a side hustle where I'm just like ask Durga, mm -hmm. <laughs> then I'll do that. You know, and so connecting within your community and creating this like silent club is like I use the word coup a lot and not to make not and not to be like militant but you know I think that people should be nervous because women are emailing each other women are DMing yes. each other women on are texting the low. The women on the are low. talking yes. to the each women other women are talking the women They've got are the talking right to the vote and now they're talking to yeah. each other the women are emailing yes yo you could be like pen pals with someone for like 10 months and then that person that no one knew about writes this like piece and just drops it and that that piece comes from emailing with women for 10 months. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually going back to because I loved I loved the um, the piece that you wrote about your name. And it's I love it so much because it's something that even a little country girl named Tracy, who <laughs> has a name that's really, really easy to spell. And, you know, people sometimes misspell it, but they're just not trying, whatever. Like it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's not as loaded an issue with my name. But I mean, there's still parts of the essay that just like resonate so loudly because I love the paragraph where you say that after you give your name to someone, the inevitable question that follows is, well, where are you from? You know, where does that come from? And that's all a part. Like, I mean, names are such a huge, like, cultural marker, like, as big as skin is and, like, hair is. Like, you know, when you see somebody who's darker than you, you know that there's some kind of cultural difference. And when you hear somebody with a quote-unquote weird name, you know, a name that's mm -hmm. not like Sally or Bob or whatever, you know, oh, you know, this is another way that I can tell that there's a marked cultural difference. To add to that, though, too, I think it's also because the this country's like perception of what race is is so wrong. <laughs> it's so narrow. It's just like the color of your skin. Yeah. And I actually uh, was emailing with a friend yesterday saying like, I hate when it's July because then all my white friends are like, I'm more tan than you. Oh, <laughs> yo. That's such a real thing. I hate July, I guys. Hate I hate July. What am I supposed to say to that? And no, that's no, what oh, I congratulations. You're so black. Oh, my God. And that's when I realized that like for a lot of people, race is simply the color of one's skin. Mm. And it's shocking to me. You know, like when you were a kid, you know, you were like, oh, I guess that's that's what's up. But now we're adults. <laughs> we are grown humans. And you just said I'm tanner than you. Yeah. <laughs> what am Seriously. I supposed to do in this situation? <laughs> you know, high five. <laughs> Outside of writing, what are other like areas of your life where you're finding yourself doing a lot of unlearning? The biggest one is probably uh Friendship and dating. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, no, let's dating. get into it. I just like went there. I know. I, I wanted to uh, change the mood. <laughs> Make it personal, guys. I've been thinking a lot about codes and, you know, speaking in code and ranging from friendship to family to beauty, you know. Having a code is more powerful to me than it's ever been. But mm. I always thought it was a form of, like, not involving people um, you know, the thing about not feeling like you belong anywhere from a very young age is you, you know, you have this like extra appendage where you're a crowd pleaser, you know, so you never bring up anything that's too controversial or uncomfortable. Yeah. And you never bring up a pop culture reference that's not inclusive. Ugh. Um, but Yo. that, but that, but the thing is that inclusive, that to be inclusive half the time, you're not including yourself, mm. you know, it's like you're, you're like, you're like hosting Speak a talk show. Yeah. You're like hosting a talk show or a game show and you're the host, you know, you're making sure everyone's good. But half the time, it's just you mediating other people's comfort levels and, you know, you're not living your full self. And so I think the coolest thing about deciding to unlearn that is that I can now choose who I'm going to see, when I'm going to see them. And it's not about, you know, separating friends. I think that's actually naive. It's more about living your full self. And if you need to 
you know, control your variables and whatever your ecosystem is. I think that's, I respect that. And I'm noticing it more uh, with the young women. And I think, I think it's great. I think as women, you're taught to like get along with everyone, mm-hmm. introduce people. Mm-hmm. I'm like the introducing people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing. And then dating or relationships and stuff like that. I think, I think my biggest unlearning is that, you know, um, I think knowing what you want in that aspect of your personal life when you grow up brown and you don't grow up in a very brown community, which mm-hmm. I didn't. Mm-hmm. You don't know because you don't really get to have wants, you know, right. you're just like, this is what's available. Yeah. And so finding like your levels of attraction or like flexing in that part of your heart or your feelings <laughs> has been very minimal. What an incredible sentence. Flexing <laughs> in that part of your heart. <laughs> yeah, it's just it doesn't exist. There's no history for it. Right. And so totally. And then also, and this is something I think about, too, I think because it's not in your environment there's like self-loathing yeah mm-hmm. you know like i would never date an indian guy <laughs> yeah because <laughs> right, the only right. one i know is my brother and my dad <laughs> right what are the what other options do i have speaking of dating as we were googling you to see what would come up oh, so obviously i know you but you know <laughs> i had to check the google so complex.com has you listed in the list of the 50 most desirable bachelorettes in new york city 50 most desirable bachelorettes in new york city talk to us about this how did you first of all how did you feel first of all a little context for our listeners Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is like four years old true let's be real 2012 yeah um next thing (laughs) no one contacted me about this i was one day taking a nap probably like on a tuesday And I got a text from a friend being like, congrats, which also gives you a little context. Like, this is why people are congratulating me. Um, oh, man. And so they just, put, you know, like, it's like everything about this is just a joke. We're just joking. And, you know, the unfortunate part is it's like one of the first things that come up if you do Google me. So mm. You can't really like, push that shit down. So <laughs> it's there. Um I was in a serious relationship at the time, so it was even funnier because there was, like, no facts, fact checking. <laughs> and even more hilarious about this is, like, you know, Katie Holmes is on this list. Oh, I didn't even scroll down. Yeah, so, no. I'm scrolling through now. <laughs> so this list is all over the place, and there's no focus. They pick 50 women, and I think I was, like, 47, so it was probably... 42, big, excuse don't, me. Okay. Don't you saw yourself, yourself okay. short in the studio. <laughs> okay, so, I'm just, today. so I'm just saying, like, there was a moment where, like, we need eight more guys. Um, Katie Holmes is 50. So it It did describe you as a member of Brooklyn's intelligentsia. Exactly. Which I'm like, shit, yes. (laughs) Where's the application? (laughs) No, I'm just glad that they at least said that. But it's like the Illuminati, guys. You don't really know who's in it and who's not. Who's (laughs) running it. It's not like a club roster You don't know where the coffee shop is, where we're all hanging out, (laughs) getting free wine. Just a nod. (laughs) It was a different time. And I have to say... This was before I started to unlearn. And so Mm. I thought this was peaking. Wow. I was like, oh, someone sees me. Mm. Now I know being seen is getting a private email from a woman writer who I admire saying like, hey, I read your piece. This Mm. resonated with me. Well, on that incredibly positive note. (laughs) That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I like to end things. (laughs) Thank you so much, Durga. Too complex. Guess what you get to do now, Tracy? What? What do I get to do? You get to tell me a corny joke. <gasps> oh no. Don't start it. Okay, I'm sorry. I need you to up, go into this. Walk I'm with me so on this journey for your with corny an jokes, open Tracy. mind. I'm Thank so hyped. You. Thank you. So one of the loves of my life, uh-huh. the greatest love of my life is bad jokes. Uh, I know. Corny jokes, I know. bad jokes. <laughs> I love them. And I love to tell them because I, I just love to see the faces of the people. <laughs> After I tell I've them the seen joke. you high five your own joke. This is true. To, I like to be allowed to tell a bad joke every episode if possible. <laughs> I won't force that uh, on you, though. We'll talk we'll about it. We'll think on that. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Okay. Um, so in all of my jokes, there's a character named Jerome. So just get used to that. It's gonna okay. Happen. So sure. two guys, Bob and Jerome, they are stranded in the desert. And they've been walking for days without water. There's no food and the sun is just beating down on them and they're getting very dehydrated and they're getting delirious, right? So they're walking, they're walking, they're walking. In the distance, Bob sees an oasis. 
right? And he's like, oh, Jerome, do you see this? There's, there's water, there's shade, we're saved, we're going to survive, we're going to live. So Bob takes off running. He's running towards the tree. <laughs> and Jerome's like, oh, snap, okay, I should follow. And so Jerome follows. And the closer that Bob gets to the tree, he sees that it's covered in bacon, right? Every limb is just draped with every kind of bacon that you can imagine. Ooh. There's there's pepper bacon, there's honey bacon, there's applewood smoked bacon, there's just a just a shit ton of bacon, right? And so he gets closer and closer to the oasis and closer and closer to the bacon, he can just smell it. And all of a sudden there's a hail of gunfire. And Bob grabs his side and he falls down into the sand and he's wounded. What? <laughs> and Jerome's like, no, my friend, my friend, this is terrible. So he starts to run towards Bob. And Bob sees Jerome running toward Bob sees. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bear Bob <laughs> sees. Bob sees. Wait, I need to say. We've already lost Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> And and so Bob sees Jerome running towards him, and Bob yells out to him, Jerome, wait, no, no, don't come any closer. It's not a bacon tree. It's a ham bush. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I can't believe this. I can't believe I stopped through that. <laughs> You get it because joke. It was ambush. I, I and then got the it. I <laughs> the the word play. Play. <laughs> got the wordplay. I'm good on the wordplay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So as we come to the end of our fantastic episode, it's time for us to buy a round for somebody or something that we're really, really into. I'm so excited about these two dudes. Um, the rap group Ray Shrimmered. I'm gonna I love it. I love them. The music is just so empty. It makes no sense. They sound like they're about 12. No, 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 no. Because sometimes you just need some music that you can just put on and just dance to and just zone out. You don't always need a message. You don't always need to worry about being politically correct. They sing about stuff that I know nothing about. Bringing drugs to parties, that's not my thing. But whatever, I'll dance to it. Yeah. The album's called Shrimp Life. I think that everybody should buy it right now and listen to Throw Some Mo featuring <laughs> Nicki. Nicki Minaj. It is so good. Ass fat. Uh, what's it? Yeah, I know. You just got cash. What's it? Blow some mo. I've listened to No Type literally every single day at work for the past two months. It never gets old. Every single day. Even though that song, they say they don't have a type, but then they go ahead and describe what their type is. It kind of annoys me. But I do think they're saying bad bitch is a type that contains multitudes. Right. But I never trust men for their multitudes to be that different. Right, right. Like a bad bitch is basically Kim Kardashian in different shades. Right. But if the bad bitch exists, then by definition, a an unbad bitch has to exist too. Yeah. Those are the ones that they don't like, so that's still technically a type. You know what? Doesn't matter. That shit still bumps hard. It does. It does. <laughs> so we buying you around. Around on us. Yes. What about you? Less around, more pouring one out. Oh, to the, to <laughs> the right, fallen bear, homes. Bear with me on this one. Okay. Uh, I'm pouring one out for Harriet Tubman. <laughs> <laughs> Just bear with me. <laughs> so the All other right. day, uh, a few friends of mine from college, who are still in college, uh, we're talking about, you know, just like college politics about like organizing around Mike Brown, around Ferguson, around like anything around like campus activism. And they were talking about how they have people when you're organizing with people of color. That doesn't mean they're all going to agree about anything. So they were talking about like how they deal with people who kind of put them in awkward positions in their like whatever like campus movement they're trying to build. And they called them defectors. <laughs> and they were talking about how Harriet Tubman would shoot defectors. And I did not n- realize that at all. Like, I knew it's not. Like she th- literally, like, figuratively, she shot. Literally. Wow. Or would threaten to. Mm. It just made me realize that, like, especially with, like, Black History Month, we are told all of the same stories. But even with those stories, I still feel like I don't know anything about them. Mm-hmm. And, and then I looked it up. There's, like, a whole, like, scholars have like really looked into like Harriet Tubman's strategies for like keeping a unified block. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, like what happens when someone's not about that life or like 50 minutes into trying to escape, they're like, nah, man, <laughs> not for me. Hold on, hold on. I, I, left out. My, I left my, uh, uh, you know, I left something in the house. I left my phone. So I just want to <laughs> <laughs> pour one out for Harriet Tubman. She was a trill ass motherfucker. True. 
moving people to freedom. And every Martin Luther King Day, every like whatever day we're taught like black history. And I still feel like I don't know anything. True, true. So pour one out for Harriet fucking Tubman. Shout out to Harriet Tubman. Shout out to you, girl. Bad bitches is the only thing that I like. All right. And that's the end of our show. Thank you so much for Yay. listening. Woo-hoo, we made it. We, we made it. it. Shout out to Jenna Weiss Berman. Jenna, Jenna. Who provides Jenna, our drinks. Jenna. Make sure we like... We keep get it to the points we're supposed to she get to. She makes sure that we make sense. Instead otherwise, of just talking around conversations. It would just be a mess. And then shout out to Julia Furlan, who's Julia, also Julia, keeping Julia, this boat Julia. steaming, running, whatever the hell she is. I don't like boats. Steaming. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Good job, Julia. I'm steaming the boat. <laughs> So if you have any questions, comments, if you need any advice, I give fantastic, horrible advice. <laughs> I would love to ruin your life for you. Uh, we give great advice. Don't <laughs> say it like that. Email us with thoughtful questions. Another round at BuzzFeed.com. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter. Also, be sure to rate us on iTunes, preferably high. If you don't like us, don't rate us. Yes. But listen. Just send us an uh, angry email. <laughs> <laughs> rate us on iTunes. Subscribe. And uh, call your mom. Call your mom. She's worried about you. That's it. Thanks for listening. Mm